So um, consider the truncate operation. Um, so this um, can be used to shrink or extend the size of a file to the specified size. Um, and um, so um, this is how um, SFTP, SFTP implements it. So you have um, 32 bits for the um, length of the um, file name and then um, the file name itself. And then um, you have a 64 bit attribute for the 32 bit attribute for the flags. And then a 64 bit um, integer for the um, for the size. And the uh, flags can be, um, well, some, for this particular example, other flags aren't really relevant. But, um, so here's how you attack it. So let's so can encrypt it and decrypt it. So um, let's say that you're working from the, the eighth byte from the end of the, um, and you want to change that bit. Um, and um, so then like, you split that bit, you don't know what it's going to decrypt to, but it, in this particular example, it kind of doesn't matter because the, um, like, well, so, like, this is the most significant bit of a 64 bit integer, and then, um, so if it changes to uh, zero, then it's going to be bigger than the whole drive. Um, so that's, um, so you just give it to build the whole drive, and have truncates implemented. Um, I mean, I'm sure truncate probably has a chance to implement that sort of thing, but that's kind of a hypothetical attack of how one might be able to exploit. Um, um, I don't know, I'm curious that's not going to play. So, um, but if the decrypted value had been checking as a hash, the truncate attack is described with report. Um, and the, this particular truncate attack, attack I described requires stream cipher because block ciphers um, have diffusion with stream ciphers don't, because stream ciphers is x one and so, like with stream cipher, you change one bit, um, and the key, is, uh, it's only one bit, a uh, bit is going to change in the um, cipher text. But, um, Black authentication encryption enables other attacks as well, some of which do 12 bit black ciphers, even though they, in this example this was 12 bit in a stream ciphers specifically. Um, but, um, so, normally in real, the real world, HMACs are used instead of hashes, and any hash algorithm can be used to create an HMAC. Um, but, um, so, there, what, any questions? Okay. So, there are attacks of authenticated encryption. So you can do encrypt and MAC. Um, this is what um, I kind of scrubbed the previous slide when I said like, if you check the, um, the data against the hash, um, you wouldn't have um, had to worry about um, someone tampering with the values of a uh, truncate and uh, potentially filling up the whole drive. Um, but um, so in this particular one, you um, um, you uh, hash the plain text and you encrypt it, and so that you can get it. Um, and um, but there's also encrypt and then MAC. So in this particular, in this one, you, um, you use the um, key as a, you you hash the um, ciphertext and then you concatenate the hash the HMAC of the ciphertext um, with the um, you concatenate to the, you concatenate the hash of the ciphertext um, with the ciphertext itself. Whereas previously it was the hash of the um, with HMAC of the plain text um, concatenated with the ciphertext. There's also a MAC then encrypt too. So in this case you. Know, um, generate the um, HMAC with the plain text and you encrypt it. Um, but the most secure one is encrypted then MAC. Um, and, um, but the kind of issue with that is um, this, there are multiple ways to combine these different cryptographic primitives, and some of them are better than others. And so what they introduced was authenticated encryption. Um, so um, AES can always counter mode, um, which is basically AES and counter mode with GHash acting like an HMAC is a um, authenticated encryption primitive. So the idea with them is um, so previously, like you have to decide how to combine them, and you have to kind of do the validation, like check the HMAC yourself, then decide the plain to get the plain text that was the, the decryption returned was valid or not. So you have to implement it yourself and implementation has could arise. But with, if you combine the terminal single encryption primitive, then uh, it's um, then it just it returns like. This is valid or this is not valid, so we don't have to worry about combining them or anything like that. And another um, one is Charge Out 20 Poly 135. Charge Out 20 acting as um, the stream stuff for M Poly 135, like HMAC. Um, so, any questions? <laughs> okay. so, That's what I can answer. Well, HMAC is an um, hash message authentication because um, you have to password and pass it to the hash and then. Mm -hmm. uh, so, timing attacks. Um, 
So this is a um, kind of a string comparison um, implementation, and um, just do it any one. And um, so you are checking to see if the um, string links are the same, and then you're looping through the length of the string. And um, if um, then the moment you find a character that's match, you return false. And then if you get to the very end and all the characters match, you return true. So the problem with this is, um, let's say the first character doesn't match, and you have like know, 100 million byte string. Um, then at that point, it's going to return sooner than it would if it was the 100 million byte that didn't match. So um, there can be slight timing differences in that, and you can kind of exploit those to the information about the um, the, the date being compared. Um, so this is a, an immune implementation. So in this case, it doesn't return prematurely. It employs the um, bitwise or operation along with um, the bitwise XOR operation to achieve a constant time. Um, and um, so, so it doesn't return those, so it's immune to time attacks. Now, um, it, um, KP5.6 introduced hash equals to perform street comparisons that are immune. So at this point, you have no need to implement your own street comparison function that's time attack immune. But time attacks can be used in more than just um, more than string comparison. Like table lookups can cause uh, cache time issues as well. And AES uses ta um, table lookups, um, which can look up on a cost time photograph. Like, for example, the AES um, instruction set, uh, the Intel chip supplements. Um, now, Chapter 20 mitigates the risk of time attacks by using um, add and rotate XO operators exclusively. Um, but, um, yes, I mean, time attack, like, board, for example, um, a PAP function board um, is, um, um, that isn't timing safe, like bits of hex and PHP. I mean, even some of the built in PHP functions that like, might not be immediately obvious as being susceptible to time attacks or. But um, as for the feasibility of them, I mean, because when I think, oh, like, with the last, the first example I gave of a string comparison implementation, like, when I think that, like, how practical is it to really attack that? And um, so, well, I guess according to this particular blog post, um, it's been shown that you can remotely detect differences in time down to 15 nanoseconds, you can sound like about, about 50,000, just 49, I'm just driving up. Um, but, so, so, so what you're saying is you shouldn't allow somebody to um, submit their password 50,000 times? Yeah, I mean, fairly bad with this, um, but yeah. So, um, any questions? Okay, so now we're going to let the public So, let's say um, Alice and Bob will communicate to Kelly Wanda, the open and secure channel. They um, need to have a um, kind of shared secret to do so. So, how do they? Um, communicate that shared secret one. I mean, they don't have a secure channel to begin with, so how do you, um, I mean, how do you change information? I mean, I guess if you physically meet one another, that would have a secure channel, presumably, and physically change information and then go off on um, different continents or whatever, and then, I guess, um, like, cause one. And I guess that's what Russia did with the ones, with the one time pass that used from the 40s to the 80s. But um, that's, that has some very real practical limitations. Um, so the real application is on key exchanges used, but um, to uh, solve this problem. Um, and um, but uh, for some of the I'm going to focus on all the which kind of segues nicely to signatures. You're going to then talk about any like the first time? A little bit. I'm not going to get too much into the details, um, but yeah. Um, I mean, it's loops so only um, does look the curve stuff, but um, yeah. So in this particular example, um, you have. Um, like so, so with normal uh, symmetric key crypto, you have each party both at the same key. Public key crypto, with both parties uh, both also known as asymmetric um, crypto. Each party has a different key, so you have um, like Alice has a public private key and um, like Bob has a private public key. And so if Alice wants to send something to Bob, um, she would um, encrypt it with um, Bob's public key, and then um, only Bob would have the would be able to decrypt it with a private key. Um, so um, the key takeaway is public and private key. Um, so it's highly number theory, right? Like we assume certain properties of uh, prime numbers. And OSA is the only major public key crypto algorithm that supports encryption. Um, DSA and ECD, ECDSA only support signatures and the field and key exchange. Um, so, um, well, I mean, the field and key exchange is not the field and ECDH, which is supposed to encrypt the common. But uh, so with OSA, you can encrypt the symmetric key for safe transit. Um, but, uh, so, for also the keys um, consist of exponent and a modulus. That's a uh, modulus is a, a divided two large prime numbers. So, let's say you have 2.4 bit offset, a prime key, 
that's um, the modulus is the multiple of two pi control bit time like this. Um, and um, so it's meant to keep good, so every um, possible combination of bits is a valid key. But in public you could that's not the case because the modulus, um, I mean, it needs to be a, a multiple of two voltage prime numbers. So like a zero, 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 one, for example, isn't um, a multiple of, I mean, like it's a multiple of one, one, and it's, but I guess if you pad it with zero, it's like, yes, a factual bit number, like two, for example, like two, but not padded um, to um, 10, 10, 24 bits. That's not a valid key for us, say, because um, two isn't, well, I guess two is prime to four. <laughs> But, um, so four isn't a valid number. Um, but, um, so here's kind of a comparison of um, the um, key sizes. Um, the, look at the comparable key size for um, symmetric key crypto versus OSA and ECDSA as well. So like, let's say you have a, let's um, say you want to be the same security as you get from 128-bit symmetric key. But the OSA you can have a 372-bit key that achieve that same level of security. And with elliptic fields, you can turn 56-bit key. And then with, um, like, for 256 bits, you need you a know, 15-kilobyte key um, to achieve, um, with OSA, the same level of security that a 256-bit um, symmetric algorithm would provide. And with EC, uh, with elliptic fields, it's probably 21 uh, bits. So it's, um, that's one of the big advantages of elliptic fields, that uh, you know, the key side, the keys would be a lot smaller, which means for, which mean the math would be much faster as well. Now, Quantum crypto kind of changes a little bit, but I'm not going to get into that. So, in, it's fiber and 21 rather than 512? Yeah, so that's um, because of the particular curve. Uh, so, um, and the curves were published by the, um, okay, so well, it's E2519 and E448, but um, the curve that provides, um, in this particular case, what you're referencing is um, a curve by the standard um, coefficient cryptography group, uh, they did the Bitcoin curve, for example, it's like each of this is K1. And um, they did this P, uh, 256 curve, but uh, in this case it's 521, it's uh, in 521, but that's what the standard specifies, so I don't know. <laughs> but, um, I mean, they don't specify 512 bit key. Maybe there's a mathematical reason for that as well. Like, I have no idea. Um, so, is there a minimum uh, uh, key size, like for uh, RSA? Uh, because 1024 is too small, is like uh, 2048, is, is, that, is that the new minimum? For, um, the for recommendation at this point is, is 4096. If you, if you insist on still using RSA and not using that, like, yeah, I um, I mean that's um, you know, from a theoretical. I mean you can have a OSA case small to be sick, but from a security perspective, the recommendations I guess. I mean like I think maybe like um, very some way to develop that stage. Um, the default is two hundred four twenty forty eight bits and some is thirty seventy two bits and I mean maybe open SL has a different um, default of that stage. I mean, but according to this, like to get over to get security things, um, 3072 bits, but uh, when some um, programs with those, those defaults are 248, I mean, I don't know, it's, um, I'm just say those programs are implementing best practices, a lot of them are probably not, but uh, it's, um, but yeah, it's definitely more than uh, 1024 bits, I mean, but, I mean, you can, in theory, you can do it, but, uh, you have a 64 bit, um, or say, you know, I don't know why you would, but, um, I don't know. <laughs> it would take a really long time to on that Well, that would be really fast. It would be small, yeah. Yeah, it would be really good crap, too. I mean, let me use some like um, crypto panels, like hackathon things. I guess when you're supposed to crack it, but. Um, um, so, um, yeah, so, in, so the type of crypto systems. So, type of. Um, so, public crypto is a lot slower than some other crypto. Um, like I said, that's because of the math operations that uh, public crypto employs. So, to remedy this, hybrid crypto systems were developed. And in hybrid crypto systems, they react to the strings and crypto with the public key. And then, um, so is the key for the symmetric cipher. This can be achieved with um, OSA or um, Dependent Key Exchange or elliptic or Dependent Key Exchange. Um, and um, so with OSA, only the recipient needs a public private key pair. Whereas with ECDH, um, elliptic group, diffie-element key exchange or elliptic group, diffie-element key exchange, both always need a public private key pair. Um, and uh, now you can um, um, do it so that um, you generate a key pair for the um, recipient and uh, kind of on the fly, and then um, let's receive that message. And that's called the equal um, diffie-element key exchange or elliptic group. 
did the only key exchange. I have ECDA, so EC and Princess so it sounds like kind of that probably. Anyway, <laughs> but um, so that's what um, encrypting a free chain string is generating kind of shared secret. Uh, and I mean, I guess the case where you generate a one-hour disposable key specific to that message is um, uh, that we well, still conceptually shared secret with this one-hour key. Um, but um, so, um, any questions? All right. So signatures. So if you wanted to um, send a secret message, you encrypt it with the recipient's public key and then encrypt it with their private key. Um, but um, if, um, if you encrypted a hash of a message with that private key, then anyone could encrypt um, that hash with your public key and so they could verify that you were the um, person sending the message. Um, so um, this is, uh, signatures are utilized for Bitcoin, for example, to um, verify. I mean, most conceptually signatures like I sign it so I say that it's from me. So I mean, the, this is kind of a digital analog saying that only I have only I can generate signature because it's which is with my private key. So um, the way I just validate it can yeah. Um, so um, but we're talking about the key exchange over here. Um, so this is kind of overview of um, how um, key exchange works. Um, so um, like you have um, a common penny to share the um, like, well, you have a common factor of share that each party has a secret factor, and then you have a, you can um, do mathematical operations on that depend on whether you can get on the key exchange or if you get on the key exchange, and you achieve a, a shared secret. And um, I think that probably should have been in the hybrid paper systems. Before, right after the time of the hybrid paper systems, so after signatures. But anyway. Um, so, um, signatures versus authentication. So, I was talking about authenticated um, encryption earlier with the truncate example. Um, and, um, and so, that one, it was um, the goal is to make sure that the tap would work. And with signatures, um, it's kind of the goal is along. The goal is to make sure that, like, I mean, like so I, I sign the message, but then if someone else can't come along, change the message and then say that that's the same message that I was sending, which is still spiritually kind of the same idea. But with authenticated encryption, so what form authenticated encryption is now passed in signature creation and verification at the center of mathematical operations. Um, but um, authenticated encryption as well, only people who can verify the message, only people with a symmetric key. Whereas with signature creation, anyone with a public key um, can verify the message and public key by virtue of the name of anyone who happens. Um, so I guess maybe in conclusion, the point of public key crypto is that you should never have shared files. So, um, any questions thus far? It's probably worth noting that um, the public key crypto side of things and signatures are part, and maybe getting into this later, are part of uh, what the, the way that if you're using like the JWTs for authentication, the way you should be doing JWTs. Um, there are a couple of other ways of doing it, but um, signatures are usually about the same. Or um, I guess we can do like the curve signatures on JWT's module as well, right? Yeah, and, and this is how authentication works with SSH too. So with SSH, you uh, you have um, the kind of random string. I mean, it's not. I mean, you have a random string, and you you sign the random string with your private key, and then the uh, the server has the public key available to verify that you uh, sign this thing with your private key unless. Um, they're able to verify that you are um, like the person who calls last the uh, public key and then you are successful log down. And so by virtue by doing it that way that uh, you can um, then enable the or say if you use the uh, authentication method or ECDSA, you can have one die and USA, whatever. Um, and, and this as an alternative to passwords or um, whatever. So um, so now um, as the practical example. So well the practical this is I don't get into examples just yet, but so Lip Sodium. So Lip Sodium is based off in ACL by Daniel Grandstack. Um, there's a bundle of the PHP, he has a PHP 7.2, and it was Charge 20, which was implemented by Daniel Grandstack. Um, Poly 1 through 5, which is a message authentication code, and when Daniel Grandstack used 2519 and Curve 2519, all implemented by Daniel Grandstack. You can find more information at the URL right there, but the um, design principle is that photography is forward, and Lip Sodium has to make it as easy as possible. Um, so, for example, um, a lot of times if you're using like an SL or 
inputs or whatever, you might be, which is deprecated, but you might be using um, out-of-date outputs like OSA, DSA, DESA, ES, CBC, or whatever. Um, but um, these are implemented now, with Sodium. So the ability to choose that data output is kind of taken away from you. Um, and also, um, one of the design ideas behind those studies is correcting my primitives um, for stuff like authenticated encryption, which we saw earlier, they're like two different methods. They know something about authenticated um, encryption primitives. But it's um, so sort of buying individual primitives to achieve something like authenticated encryption instead of just using a single consolidated primitive is um, um, the possibility of mutation errors can arise. And so, we're starting to take care of that for you. you know, Create a compliance from this for you. It doesn't, um, and so, so you don't have to do that. But it's also not a universal CATSIA either. Um, so if you're going to be interoperable with a uh, legacy program or protocol, you may still need OS, say, or AES and Canada or whatever. And um, also, look, so can you support the best passion by um, passionate hash, hash update stream, hash file? Like, let's say you wanted to generate hash of a 2GB file, you want a local 2GB file that's in memory. Um, but um, with, um, with something you would have to. And OpenSL has the same limitation, but you can kind of um, emulate um, progressive encryption with um, block cipher modes. So it's not really a big issue there was, um, with um, with something that's um, more of an issue. I mean, if, if you want to put it to be my file. And also, best practices change. So an example of best practices changing, so in 2009, best practice was to use AES and count mode with an HMAC. Um, in 2015, the recommendation was to use chi 20 with Apollo 105 or AES and Google's count mode, GCM. In 2018, um, best practice became X also 20 um, with Apollo 105. So best practices change. Um, and um, so, um, like, so, consider that as this example. So, and up and down, we're studying the three different mutations of chi 20 and Apollo 105. And so, one kind of question we might have is what's the difference? Um, and the differences are fairly subtle. So, like, the, the, this particular, so I guess you can see that the function names are right there. Like, the, um, the second two functions have IETF as kind of the function in the function name, was the first one doesn't. And then the last function has x preceding cha cha 20. And the x stands for extended, for extended knots. But um, the, um, so the original construction um, is one that doesn't have the IETF thing, because it was developed before the IETF OSC described the chat when it was implemented. And um, it um, has the authenticated um, additional, it, it constructs the poly 1 via 5 in a certain way that differs from the description for it given in the um, IETF OSC. So then IETF OSC came out and kind of changed the how the poly 1 via 5 was constructed. So hence this new function, which has the IETF. In the name. But then um, one of the problems I introduced that I guess came out with that one was the um, non screeners. So um, then this extended non version um, helps um, this non um, reuse resistance. So um, it's, um, so, I mean, that's kind of an example right there how um, loop sodium, I guess, for all of the design principles, but still kind of have confusing elements to it. Um, so, no, any questions? Okay, so I'm going to move on to some examples now. So, this is how you do authenticated encryption with loop sodium. Pretty straightforward, then um, plain text, non aka ID, and then uh, and the key. Um, so, um, in this particular example, it's um, doing, um, let's see, XALSO 20 and Poly 105, and um, in the Chacha 20 implementations, um, uh, the three that I described earlier, that, that does have an additional data parameter which can be empty. Um, that, that was uh, these um, functions don't. Um, but um, Lipsodium also has an um, AES 36 um, Lewis catalog of quotation as well. Um, so, this is how you do authentication control on this cell. So, um, it's much more robust than Lipsodium. The tag is not dependent to the cybertext, it's its own parameter. Um, and um, this one has one of the AAD parameters as well. And then, um, the, um, the tag in the AD found was one added to OpenSL and put into PHP 7.1. Um, and also, um, Cha Cha 20 Poly 1 via 5 is not supported by this. Um, so, um, but we just look at the function definition right there, it looks like it just seems easier. Um, and um, so that's pretty much what I just said right there. Um, 
And um, uh, well, I guess I mentioned like so. What in like the tag A and D parameters were introduced in 7.1 was low sodium in introduced in PHP 7.2. Um, but uh, so I guess if you use it in 7.1, you want to authenticate encryption um, without using the user land implementation. Then um, I guess you have to make use of those two parameters despite it not being as. Um, I mean, I guess you use them as habit. Anyway, um, so this is unauthenticated encryption, um, which we shouldn't really try to do. Um, Given I mean, the examples uh, of the issues I um, showed in the earlier slide with authenticated encryption, but um, it's um, um, so in this uh, example, we use XSOL to try as the cipher um, XSOL to be for extended mass. Um, so um, yes, I do with OpenSL. So I mean, you saw that like, OpenSL raw data parameter, which is you had in the other example too, and which is some kind of like, I mean, you need it because otherwise it'll be by, by default number sales like hex encoded, but it's um, not quite as um, cut and dry as the um, um, lip sum implementation. But one of the big maps that one is the Dreamless Algorithm is all supported. Um, you can do AES below fish RC2, RC4, um, whatever, um, which may be necessary for legacy applications. Um, you can use it to um, build an authentication scheme, which you shouldn't do, but I mean, maybe you need to do from compatibility with something. Um, and um, it doesn't support um, progressive encryption um, like um, like oh, sh I'm used with hash um, extension. Um, Encrypt actually did, but um, open cell doesn't, but you can emulate it with um, block ciphers. Um, but um, so I guess for authenticated uh, I would say uh, uh, Luke Sabin has the easier to use API for um, an authenticated encryption, I would say. Um, OpenSL, um, I guess due to its versatility, has the better API. Um, I guess some um, trade offs of like, versatility versus uh, opportunity to make mistakes is that a subjective thing. But, uh, so, this is an example of public crypto. Um, so, um, this particular example is doing um, X2519 and X um, for um, elliptic of Diffie key exchange, and X also um, 20 with probably 1 to 5. And it um, so it requires both the sender and the recipient to have a public private key pair. Um, and um, you know, as you can see in the first um, method call up there. And it, uh, if you move the Hamlin, um can be done, but the, you have to use another function. Then this is how you do decryption with it. So like in both cases, you have the um, so you put the box key pair well, the method and you call it. So you put the box or so you put the box open. Um, and, um, so you can do with the female Diffie-Hellman 2, um, and the female Diffie-Hellman is um, the one where the um, recipient doesn't have to have the public private key pair. But um, in that case, um, so for the last one, there's a Knox parameter, um, and um, so I didn't put the box seal of have a Knox parameter because it generated that parameter. But um, so this is um, how you do public decrypt to hold up that So um, it's um, a much less um, uh, so with a public crypto, you can only do all say with um, OpenSL, um, and you can only do um, PKCS one time. You can't do OAD keypad, which is the best practice for a all say. Um, and um, you know like the the E and B keys and the pub key um, IDs parameters or arrays, and that's because with OpenSL seal, um, you can do multiple keys. Um, and um, none of the normal things too is public keys have to be X copy certificates. Um, but they can't just be like a begin or say um, like public key or whatever. So that's um, an annoying thing with that one. And you decrypt that with OpenSL open. Um, that's pretty much what I just said. Um, and um, with OpenSL, you can build your own um, like hybrid um, public key encryption thing. You can do like um, OpenSL DHQ key to be the shared secret, but that doesn't support the security if you don't look the PHP binds of OpenSL. You can open yourself up and uh, do all the same encryption, which is what the, um, that last example was doing. But in that last example, PKCS was one's core code it was if you open yourself up and you can specify the patterns you want to use the parameter. Um, so you can use the, the better pattern schemes for that one. Um, but um, so, signatures. Um, this is how you do signatures in um, Lipsub. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. You have um, it's two parameters, message and a secret key. And, um, and then um, 
to create it and then um, to verify this publication message. Um, and um, then that um, is E2519 and Jeff R12, the signature is pre printed to the message. Um, and um, so this is how it was done as well. Um, so um, let's see, and then you have verified with OpenSL Verify, and this one supports ECDSA, RSA, and DSA, but it does not support E2519, which is what it would sell you in one day. E2519 is the best practices algorithm. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, so if you need some, um, I think it's practice compatibility, um, you would need this one of the best practices. If you're going to be interoperable with yourself, then um, but um, now PHP does support uh, like I said. Um, OpenSL is um, supported on SL for is actually still very new. It was only um, E2.5.1 that was on in September 11th of last year. And the policy um, described that um, the key format was on standardized in August. So, um, but given that, I don't think it's super surprising that um, OpenSL doesn't support for E2.5.1 not yet. Well, at least PHP is my next to it now. But, um, so that's pretty much the talk. Um, any questions? Uh, so what was on some of the code that uh, there was the for or like ID? Uh, what was that that you were passing in? Um, so the initialization vector. Yeah. It's a, it's a little bit of randomness, which you can use uh, random bytes or something like that uh, to uh, give you a random part to start off with so that if you encrypt, is it, then you is say it like yeah. for, to prevent timing attacks? It's yeah. not to prevent timing attacks. It's, so, well, how it is that it can be used only in terms of the uh, block stack mode operation? So, in case of um, stack of block chain, which is what CBC has happened for, you, the IV is exported against the plain text, and then you, uh, at least initially, and then uh, subsequently um, the um, stack of text that you get back from the Block stack for encryption um, is um, utilized kind of as a basically an ID parameter as a basic block. Exactly. Um, and, and it's actually in this way that you're able to emulate uh, progressive encryption with um, openness with the block stack because um, what you're using the chain is essentially doing the same thing as IP. So you just, um, if you want to kind of like stole it off, I guess, like, uh, like let's say you want, you, you Stop there, and then you have to resume that for whatever. Like, maybe there's like one megabyte, only one to one megabyte block. So at this point, you just kind of resume the restore the state by um, using the um, last block of the cyber as the IP, and then you just resume the state. Um, and that's um, can't do those two because the state is long and complicated. It's, uh, the state doesn't just consist of that IP. It's um, so there's loop setting generated its own IP like. To start with, and then it just in some cases, yeah. Lips, so, lip starting in some ways is kind of like a um, kind of cryptographic format, like it, uh, like in um, some of the examples I was um, showing, it um, would be catching the signature for you, it wouldn't be a some type of parameter, or maybe a group hand signature or whatever. So, in some cases, it's um, like in the, the um, um, for one of the examples I gave on a much later slide. Um, the um, it generated was um let's see. so um, in this case the IV or not um, was generated on map because it looked like two D hash of the concatenation of the um, of both parties public keys. So so that's an example right there of um, the initialization vector for not because it's basically the same thing being um automatically generated. Um, but in theory that should be random. Um, but it's also that one is uh, I think it's open for people to see. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, Jack, since we're talking about nonces, um, you know, one, one, why do you say that, uh, you know, WordPress uses that they have like six of them or something, and, and there's some website and it's like, you, it's like, you know, you go to it, it's like, I think it's salt or something in the URL. You're talking about cross-site request for the degree of attacks and, and have mm -hmm. most that used to protect against those. Okay. Yeah. Like, well, in Word, like WordPress, they're like, oh, just go to this URL and we'll generate all the six nonces that we need to, that they use in their, uh, in WordPress. Um, and the new one's generated on every request. 
Yeah, yeah so, so those, I think it's the uh, cross area festival with your attacks and those. Uh, and the same, I mean, this, this, I mean, this is, both of them will spread strings of uh, bias that don't tend to um, like, necessarily be predictable. Um, and, um, yeah, so I mean, but, I mean, the, I guess, you use some of them, I mean, you said some of them, I mean, even in the case of block ciphers, and ID, um, how block ID is used ultimately depends on the mode of operation. Uh, but in the case of cross area test forgery attacks, you yeah, like you kind of save the nuts and then you run the form, submit the nuts, and you check the nuts that the form has against what was like in the session or database or whatever, and then come oh, in cash, whatever. And then you see if they, they're equal, and if they're not, then the submission is valid. Um, so, but I mean, the idea of the both of them being random seems to the bias is um, the same concept there. Well, I, I mean, I guess what I was, what, sorry, and the, the actual question was like, how bad is it to use that? Uh, given that, you know, yes, you're the only one that sees those that, that you know, is responded back, but it's kind of a central point of failure because everybody, most people just go to that URL and then like copy the, the output into their own WordPress. Uh, so uh, it seems very right for, you know, like finding basic facts or figuring out kind of like how those those nonsense are generated because like ever like all there's all these millions of WordPress sites that are all reliant on you know like going to that page and then setting it up and you know generating those initial values. Well that's I guess um and it's to why um, I guess um you know as if you have a secure image and you're supposed to um like um we'll just plug into your app for example with yeah, the secure so you definitely don't want to be able to um I guess ascertain patterns would be able to predict what would be generated next from like I think what they should have given like seven hundred consecutive um, I guess outputs you could predict all the subsequent outputs and they could identify you could figure out the the state. Um, and um, so that's something you don't want to do with um, when generating these random strings. Um, and so I like, if you like with with knowing like, what press is doing different you wouldn't be able you wouldn't want to be able to and then I have as much of that else as a question. I I mean is it is it better to have like something central like that that is and secure that one thing or make it easier for everybody to generate their own? But if you have if you have eight three seven O or above, you can generate you, you have a cryptographically secure that's, know, that's the why number generator. Uh, that you have access to. It, it should, like, people should have the ability to, you know, just run something locally and bury all that stuff versus, like, go to this front page and copy paste. And, you know, the, well, the, 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 yeah. I think the catch with that is you have a WordPress side of things that they, you're not guaranteed the ability to have even, like, open SSL random pseudobytes on the machine where WordPress is installed. As of right now, WordPress doesn't yet require PHP 7.0, so they can't say, "Oh, we'll just run random bytes internally and call it a day." Right. Yeah. No. Well, I think do it WordPress will be doing. Um, we would be requiring 5.6, and we'll be inserting the compact for um, signature verification for. Because um, this WordPress is auto update, um, like the WordPress, so like let's say, I don't know if it's kind of version WordPress. Well, WordPress 5.2 is the first version of WordPress that doesn't support PHP 5.2. Okay. Yeah. So, but that's. Um, I these about you can even use space out of that too. And it's um, um but yeah when they switch over to five dot six and incorporate um so they can compact they'll be able to um so so can compact um it kind of has a well, so you can compact uses it again compact as a um as a positive dependency. And um so and the compact has um like it'll do like open SL to the end of it, so encryption that idea of that's what's available on the system or it'll look at WN. It does a number of things, but um, looking on what is available on um, post OS, but um, it's, um, it's an effective show. It's, it works for now until the application can support something there. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the talk.